welcome to one of my favorite versions of Garden Gab, where you get to hear from someone other than me, and you get to today hear from one of our very, very good friends, Miss Karen Chapman. And today we're talking about fall container design and her tips. Karen is so well known for her container plantings and um, we're so excited for her to be able to join us and talk about some of her favorite plants and how she utilizes them. So welcome, Karen. We're excited to have you back. You. Oh, it's great to be back with you. Hey there. <laughs> so fall is such a fun time. You know, I live in zone four, Minnesota. You are in the Seattle area. Talk maybe a little bit about what gets you excited about deco pots in fall, especially in your area in the Pacific Northwest. Well, the great news is I can be lazy um, because there's actually still, I know it's a good way to start, right? You know, there's actually a lot still looking pretty good from summer. You know, things like million bells are still looking really colorful. All the foliage plants I put in there are great. Celosia, zinnias, you know, there's a lot still happening, but sure enough, there's a few things definitely past the best, but I don't have to completely start from scratch quite often. I can just add in a few extra little things to really celebrate the full season. And here I can even try and get them to go all the way through winter. I know that's not quite so easy for you. <laughs> no, we uh, we are getting to the point where we're starting to defoliate and everything is about to start sh to shut down. And our, our palette of evergreen shrubs and uh, uh, plants is a little narrower than you have. <laughs> <laughs> Move to Seattle, solve your problem. <laughs> <laughs> so let's... Um, talk a little bit about how you approach your your design plan when you're you're working on uh, decopots. I know that you've got an infamous approach to how you do it. Tell us a little <laughs> bit about it. Well, you know, I like to have a kind of a stepwise approach, but the most important thing is I always build around a foliage framework because flowers, even the full flowers aren't going to last forever. So I really make sure I've got great foliage, but I start off by looking for what I call a spotlight plant. And that's typically something which has got more than one color in it. And a great example, one of my favorites of yours is that hypericum that you've got, which is called pumpkin because it's got those beautiful sort of corally orange colored berries right now. There's often a few yellow flowers still hanging on. The leaves are a beautiful green with almost like a touch of blue to them, just stunning. So I'm looking at that thinking, okay, I've got three colors to work with there. That's a great springboard. So then my next part of the design process is to find a way to highlight one of those colors I've just seen. And in your case, what I'd love to do is to bring in what you know is my favorite Nandina that you do. It's that cool glow <laughs> pomegranate. Oh my gosh, you know, it's not a screaming orange. It's a beautiful, it's softer than that, but it's warm. And when you put that with the pumpkin hypericum, you've just got this fabulous celebration going on of all those warm tones. It really starts those fiery colors. So and I think it's really important for folks to realize how you need to make a connection between two or more plants before you add anything else. So, you know, having made that connection, you know what we have to do now? We have to have no. a party. <laughs> Our favorite. <laughs> our, our favorite. I know you and I, we kind of do that sort of thing. So <laughs> what I like to do, having got that connection, is to throw in a wild card, something somebody wasn't expecting. Um, so it's where you can add an unexpected color, an unexpected texture, an unexpected type of plant. So what I would might do with this one is to maybe bring in some of the yellow, um, perhaps the Hucarella. There's one called Yellowstone Falls, which is a trailing form, well worth digging out, finding. Um, that would be a nice sort of addition, but then have some fun with it and maybe throw in dinosaur kale. You know, those big, tall, yes. knobbly leaves on those kales, you know, throw yes. that in at the back for some height and texture. Um, and then maybe add some black Mondo grass. In fact, I might even put the whole thing in a black container just to really make those bright colors pop. And well, it's full. So maybe to finish it off, we find a nice big pumpkin and just set that at the base of the pot. I'd say that's going to make a pretty good statement for full. That sounds amazing. I love having the kale in there too, as that backdrop and the texture that's so such an important piece, even having that big broad leaf with the more narrow leaf uh, Nandina in there. We're so jealous of those of you that get Nandina here in Minnesota because that that really beautiful, vibrant color as you go into the winter months is just so stunning. And to be able to have this, this design that you put together, not only be fall, but extend into those winter months, 
is enviable for us. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the other really cool thing is that, you know, to think of it not just even as a full container, but you can take those plants and especially the larger ones and transplant them into the landscape in spring if you wanted to do that or as things get too large. And there's great value in using shrubs actually in the container designs where you can begin to experiment with colors and textures, as you've said, but then build on that. Um, so it's a fun way to do some experimenting. I love doing that too. And, you know, shrubs and containers is sometimes a little bit of a foreign concept, but especially if you, like you said, you're trying something new, you don't know how it's going to look in the landscape, how it might behave with sun exposure or something in that area. You can try it in that, that container for that first year, see how it does. Or if you're starting off with a smaller container that you find in a garden center, putting it in that deco pot elevates it in that landscape. So you can actually see how it's going to look with the surrounding. I think it's such a fun way to, to, to play. Definitely. And if you wanted to scale it up for the landscape, you might even think about adding in something like your lemon burst arborvitae, gorgeous golden yellow tones that would totally play into those colors that we've just been working with, but then start to add that sort of higher piece, the taller piece in the garden itself. So you can really work and have fun with that. Oh, that's so fun. So I know that there is another deco pot that a concept that you like working with with maybe a little bit bigger pot and one of our mm -hmm. other favorite textural shrubs will you tell us about that one absolutely well my favorite shrub for this one would be that tianshan seven sunflower the botanical name is hectocodium oh my gosh what a winner and this is a great one to really showcase in fall because you have fragrant white flowers that begin to bloom late in the summer going through into fall i have some in my office right now and the fragrance is just filling this room and then when the flowers fade you have the red calyx um, left behind so that's kind of interesting but even on the young shrub the bark oh my goodness the bark mm. peels and so it's got beautiful visual interest during the winter months the trouble is, when I've been looking for these at the nursery, it's really hard to find them in a big size, you know, something which is landscape worthy from the get go. So using a container is a good way to kind of put them where you want them, maybe put the container where you want that to ultimately be, but plant the shrub into the container so you get that instant height. And then while it's still growing in and filling in that space, we can add some other things around it. I think that that's such a great point because Tianshin, which can get into that large shrub, small tree size, when you buy it in a two gallon, three gallon, even a five gallon, you know, it's only going to be maybe a couple of feet tall. And you're like, oh, it's such a bummer when you get it in, you think you're going to have this big 10 foot thing right away. So to have that elevated height to start off with and test it in the space is such a great idea. Yeah, so, and, you know, it, it's meant to be a specimen plant. It's meant to be a yeah. focal point. So using the container just emphasizes that even when it's young. So if you're planting this in a container, someone does find it in the garden center and they want to try this, what would you pair with it? Well, again, working off that bark, I think there's two things to be thinking about. First of all, don't obscure the bark. So don't plant things around it, which are going to get really tall. It's much better to go with low mounding plants or even trailing plants in a container so that you can showcase it. And since the bark has got some very soft tones in, I think I would play with that. There's a really cool new kid on the block. And we all love playing with new kids. There's a type of winter green called Winter Splash. And I only saw it for the first time last year, but it is readily available now. And it has um, foliage, which is green and white, variegated with quite a lot of pink in it as well. It's so pretty. And then earlier in the season, it has white flowers. Right now it's beginning to get some berries as well. So, so much color and yet it's low growing. So I would probably add a number of those around the Tianxian. I definitely have you know, Tianxian in the middle of the pot but begin to kind of work that out. And that would be one way again to highlight some of those softer tones, which I saw in the bark and the flowers of uh, Tianxin itself, which would be my spotlight plant. 
But then you know what comes after highlights? Party time. Party time. <laughs> so it's party time. So, you know, there's a couple of things you could do. You know, first of all, if you really felt you needed a trailing element, you may well still have Dichondra Silver Falls in your containers. They transplant surprisingly easily. So you could tuck those in. But I might introduce blue as a, a new color, maybe bring in some soft blue pansies, um, add those for some extra winter color. Again, they're not going to obscure the bark of the tree, which is so important, um, but it would just add you that extra little something. So I think that would just be really clean and cool and elegant, very different look from the fiery tones of the other design. Well, and I'm glad that you talk about color, number one, because I think that is so important. And you know, looking at what your aesthetic is, what your the color of your house is, or what the rest of your landscape is, how you play mm -hmm. off of that. But that bark on Tianshan, you know, when I started learning plants a number of years ago, people would say, oh, this exfoliating bark is so cool. And I'm like, what in the world are you talking about? <laughs> and then you see it and you're like, okay, I get it. That makes sense. That is so cool. And especially as that limbs up and you can see that, that starting to be exposed, it is just so cool and that texture that it can add to the landscape is so important um even as you're sort of glancing past it having that pop out at you um really draws your attention to the plant and to the combination that's just so spectacular very much so and what's really fun is my husband is not a gardener he'll move things when i ask him to or build <laughs> things but even he notices the trees which we do have in our garden with the gorgeous bark um, so he's completely flower blind. He does better with foliage. He kind of has to. Um, but <laughs> he's no, learned. He's totally into the bark. I know. Yeah, that's kind of a given. He has to do that now. But no, the bark, you know, speaks to him as well. Particularly, it's got snow on it. Oh, it's just gorgeous. It it really is. And now I need to go out and uh, do all of the things and get all these things planted because, you know, I bought a house like a year and a half ago and. You know, like the whole cobbler's kid has no shoes uh, scenario. Well, I've still got a lot of work to do at my house and my front entry is bare right now. So mm -hmm. I need to get out and get doing some planting. Um, this was so inspirational and it's always such a such a joy to talk to you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so we talked a lot about foliage today. Karen, for those of you that didn't see our conversation last time, is a very well-renowned author focusing on foliage. So Karen, if people want to learn more from you, will you tell us a little bit about your book and where they can uh, find more information from, from you? Sure. Well, the center for everything I do is my website and that's lejardinedesigns.com. That's easy to find. Um, from there, you'll have links to all three of my books, two based on designing with foliage first and one also on deer resistant design. Um, I'm also on Facebook for Le Jardinet, and you'll find everything you need to know in either of those two places. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We so appreciate it. It's always such a treat. Um, thank you to everyone for watching. Make sure to stay tuned. Check out all of Karen's information, and we'll be back to talk with you very soon. Get out and enjoy those beautiful fall gardens. Mm -hmm.